USCHO.com. This is the USCHO Week in Review podcast from U.S. College Hockey Online at USCHO.com. A look at this weekend in college hockey and a review of the top news of the week. Welcome to USCHO Weekend Review for Monday, January 10th, 2022. I'm Ed Trevsker alongside Jim Conley and Derek Schooley. This podcast is brought to you by DCU Digital Federal Credit Union. What will DCU mean to you? Find out today by visiting dcu.org. Membership required. Well, some of the big news of the weekend broke last night, and that is Minnesota goaltender Jack LaFontaine signing with Carolina. Uh, As the Hurricanes are just really desperate up and down the ranks looking for goaltenders, Uh, they're missing some at the AHL level. So that leaves Minnesota uh, in, in a tough situation with not a whole lot of experience. And some of their backup experience left school and transferred to Wisconsin last year, and that's Jared Moe. What about uh, the Golden Gophers at this point? That's crazy. I mean, uh, I think uh, if you look back, there, that hasn't happened very often. You sit here and um, you, at this time of year with that happening, I think all that needed to be uh, what people thought about it was was uh, Coach Motzko's uh his his response it was very short very terse and we wish him the best of luck and now we now it leaves them with with two inexperienced goalies now these are good goalies Justin Close and and Brendan Boynton um they're good goaltenders so it's just they're untested it's unproven and it takes a top 10 team and all of a sudden throws a lot of question marks in it you're also going to lose some players from the Olympics where will that team be when those players get back and how does this affect them as far as, uh, you know, where they're going to be come NCAA tournament time. Yeah. I I think it's really tough timing wise, you know, Minnesota just sweeps the weekend against Michigan state. They jump into first place in the big 10. They feel like they're probably riding a bit of a high. I get, I get why he goes, you know, 250,000 reasons in a signing bonus alone for, LaFontaine, he'll get a prorated, you know, salary this year. It seems like Carolina wants to get him in quickly, get him, get some games in him quickly as well. Um, but, you know, he, you know, he won the Richter award this year and had a fantastic season a year ago, but what's interesting is his numbers weren't there this year. You know, he, you know, he was seventh nationally in wins with 12, but his goals against ranks 41st nationally at 2.69 and his save percentage tied for 46th nationally at uh, 900. You know, this is a kid who was not actually having the greatest season. If there was going to be a time that you would have thought he would have left, it would have been the last off season. Um, so to leave in the middle of the season, uh, you can see the desperation right now for the hurricanes, you know, decimated by both injury and obviously COVID they're just trying to find some depth um, for both the NHL and AHL clubs. Um, but it, it does, Derek, you're right. You know, timing, you know, we'll get to it later. The Olympians that, that they're probably going to lose, um, that'll be playing for team USA. It's going to be difficult for, for Minnesota, you know, the, the next month and a half, which is for the most part, the rest of the regular season is going to be, um, a big test, but this is where you kind of see where the character is in a locker room. You know, you're going to be down, you know, arguably four of your best players. Um, three of them will get back for the postseason. Jack LaFontaine, he's done. You'll never have him back again. But, you know, what is the character like in that dressing room? What are these younger goaltenders, Justin Close and, you know, Brendan Boynton, what are they like? Um, you know, I know that Boynton had a pretty good season. Um, in juniors last year, close, they, people have believed that he has some ability. He just not, he's not getting reps because you had a good goaltender in there. So now these, these two young goaltenders, untested goaltenders will get a chance right in the middle of the big 10 rush, you know, right down the stretch of the season, trying to win a regular season championship. I mean, I'm really interested. I'll be watching this one pretty closely. And don't, don't discount the ability potentially to, I don't know what their semester is. I mean, you could, they could still potentially bring in an, a, a goalie at semester. Um, a lot of semesters are starting today. Some you have some sort of leeway. Maybe they bring somebody in a, as a, I know they've publicly said that close is, they have a lot of confidence in close. And uh, I watched Boynton play last year 
a lot on video because we were looking for a goalie and he is a, a an outstanding goalie. Um, so, but don't, I mean, they're, you're going to need a third for practice. They're, they're one away. So they are going to have to add somebody, whether it's a club goalie, something, um, they're going to have to add that because with COVID right now, you need three, you know, some people are even saying out there in, in the recruiting world, you need four right now because of, of, of where it is. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if some they, they do add a goalie in some form. And also you said, this is the character. Bob Motzko has done some of his best work as a, an underdog with uh, Team USA. And, and, and he's done, he's done some, and when he was at St. Cloud rebuilding that, some of his best work, he's an outstanding coach. Uh, and he, he will get the best out of him. And you know what? With them losing four, you can always cancel the games. <laughs> uh, Derek, uh, it, on ice, when you, when you have some untested goalies in there like that, do you do anything different with a game plan? Do you try to limit shots? Do you try to uh, play a little bit more defensively to uh, help the goalies in, or do you just just keep doing what you're doing? No, I mean, you're going to play your system, but I will tell you when a third goalie gets in or when a, a, a new freshman comes in, they're, the players are elevated. Uh, they're blocking shots. They're, they're keeping pucks. The out, they're gaining zones. They're playing uh, – more aware um, they're not as comfortable and it's it's not a shot at uh the the new goaltender it's just they don't have uh, a proven uh winner behind them yet and and they're going to do what they can to protect that goalie and make him look good it's a it's a compliment when um a third goalie goes in and you watch players dive to block shots and because they bo- they they want to do what, what's best in front of that goalie so he's successful and they want to give them some time. I mean, uh, my first, we had Francis Murat when he came in. And Ed, you'll remember the game we at, at RIT. He was a freshman and, and we were down a lot. And our guys were blocking shots. And we were down five, I think it was five one. And guys were blocking shots, diving in. It was his first game. And all of a sudden he made then, he got comfortable. He made some saves. And then the players start playing better with more urgency. And uh, we ended up coming back and winning that game. And, uh, but I'll tell you this, it, uh, it, the players will be heightened. They'll be excited for the kids too. The locker room will be excited for, uh, the next goalie to go in. And, and, you know, I always remember, uh, my first college game. One of the guys said to me, as I was walking out, they said, uh, you've played in bigger and better games than this. You've played against better teams. He goes, go out and play hockey. And that's what the, what the goaltender will be. We'll, do. well, it should be fun to watch that happen. Uh, just another twist in the in the, the crazy storylines for this year. I didn't even get a rise out of Jimmy. I didn't even get a rise out of him when I said just cancel the game. I mean, <laughs> uh, I didn't get a didn't even get I got a, 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 a rise smile, not even a, a, a if, if you could see this on uh, on Zoom like we're doing it. I didn't even I just got a little chuckle. He didn't want to go there. He wasn't taking the bait. My New Year's resolution is blown right now. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, that is in the past. And, you know, the whole brain trust at uh, USCHO really uh, expected uh, UMass to have a good weekend at Michigan. But uh, the Wolverines uh, swept the Minutemen 5-2 to and 4-1. to Uh, It solidified them at number two right now in the pairwise. And that's really important. That's top seed versus... Uh, second seed in a regional if things ended right now. Um, talking about things in the rearview mirror, this puts a lot uh, behind the Wolverines right now. What a, what a great segue there. But uh, I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, I watched uh, the, the game last night on on, on uh, ESPN or ESPN2 or, or whichever ESPN it was on, um, and Michigan looked really good. Um, they they were attacking. They They created a lot of pressure. Portillo was good when he, he wanted to be, uh, when he needed to be, I shouldn't say. Uh, but I mean, they, they looked at times to make you mass pedestrian. Uh, I think at one point in the series, Moro was minus six and, uh, you don't take a, a, a really, really good defenseman and, and, and do that. But, um, they, they look good. They look good. They look like they had a chip on, on their shoulder. It looked like they, they had something to prove. And you know, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if they do. They, you know, they they took a pretty public beating 
um, for what they did at the GLI and, and not playing that game against Western. And I think that th- that translated into the locker room and there was what a perfect time to throw a really good opponent, the defending national champion, which had been red hot, had not lost a game in regulation since the opening weekend of the season. Um, but now, you know, I'll tell you for UMass, this kind of hurts them. They're down right on the square on that pairwise bubble. Um, despite the fact that they probably feel like they've had a good season to date, but you know, you've got four losses right now in games that if you had won any of the Michigan or Minnesota state, that really would have bumped up your, your ranking. And instead you lose all four of those two at home, two on the road. And you're, you're, you're now in kind of pairwise limbo and you've got to find a way to win some games here down the stretch. And I, I loved Greg, Greg Carville, real honest yesterday after the game just said, we were, we were shown where our weaknesses are and we've got a lot of work to do, but this is a good weekend to learn. And I think that that anytime I've seen this team is when they struggle, they do seem to get better. And I think that this was probably a humbling weekend for UMass, a long flight home. Um, you know, after being out there, they went out a day early because of weather and they've been out in Ann Arbor for a while. And, you know, to have to come back now without a, a single point, it stinks. So I think that this is something I bet you'll see UMass play some of its best hockey over the next two, three weekends because they will be hungrier. A team that moved inside the pairwise bubble with the games last weekend is Cornell. Uh, they are at about number 14 right now in the pairwise as we're recording. Uh, I don't want to pick on the North Dakota fan base because I think they're the best fans out there, but they're not always the most educated and a whole lot of them were just really dismissive of Cornell in the week leading up that ECAC was really uh, secondary and nowhere near as good as the NCHC, but uh, a pretty good statement and a huge comeback also in Friday's game. Uh, this this takes a Cornell team that we've been talking about being so far down, uh, especially because of the ties. Now they're right back in the mix. Well, and, and some adversity too. You know, last week we were talking about Arizona State with a big sweep. And uh, we saw where that where that's gone, and I think we can put, pop their their pairwise bubble. Unfortunately for Arizona State, they're they're they they've got a long way to go. But uh, they were down at the same spot, down at at twenty eight. I mean, those are those are massive wins for uh, um, Cornell to get all the way up to fourteen, and doing it with some adversity. Mike Schaefer was not feeling well. And uh, obviously, when you're not feeling well, you don't want to be around your team. So he was not at Saturday night's game. And Ben Sire, um, who's a, a very good assistant coach and um, probably has had probably chances to go some places before. But he's undefeated. I think he's like 6-0-4 in, as acting head coach. And one, that means Shafee either gets sick a lot, he gets suspended, or, uh, you know, he, he has a lot of confidence in Ben and so do the teams. And. Like in the same, like we talked about with a, a goalie, um, a new goalie coming in, the players do rise up to that occasion for for a coach too, and uh, they want to they want to see Ben have be successful. They don't want to let him down as well because he recruited a lot of those guys. So game two, when it's difficult, they've already, it, it would have been real easy for Cornell to go up. We got a split. We've already got what we needed to do. We've got an excuse. Our coach isn't here. Um, you know, nobody expected us, uh, you know, like you said, dismissive fan base. Nobody expected us to win. There would have been a, a whole bunch of reasons to say, uh, let's get the, we got the split, let's get out of town. But now they're, they, they got the sweep and they've climbed to 14 and really puts uh, uh, the ECAC back kind of in, in the mix because there aren't many uh, uh, games left as far as the, uh, the pairwise go. Non-conference, I should say. Yeah, by the way, I, th- I think it's 8-0-4 for Ben Sire. That is a lot of games that Shafe misses, but, uh, you know, Benny's a great guy, one of my favorite guys in hockey. He, he does a, a super job, so I'm not surprised that they pulled off that. Whoa, 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 whoa. I thought, wait, wait, wait. I thought well, I was. I mean, one of my favorite guys. you got to say, you know, you got to keep some perspective here, schools. <laughs> but, you know, I, I look at th- this weekend, and when you're down, Three one late on Friday, and thing you know, the, it was a game that Cornell had kind of held close, but then you know North Dakota gets that insurance goal early in the third, and you're saying, "Well, that's it, okay." 
uh, you know, I had no plans on them coming back. I know that they responded to the three, one goal pretty quick, made it three, two, but then it was a, a, you know, kind of a, a, a five, six minute span. And I'm saying, okay, well, you have four minutes left. This game's over. Then, uh, you know, my, I, I wasn't listening. I was just following it online and I didn't even have a chance to see the tying goal. And suddenly Cornell had a lead. And that's, that's pretty remarkable, but that seemed to be the moment in the weekend that changed everything for Cornell and gave them some believability. Listen, I think they lose that Friday game. I think they lose Saturday as well, but you win Friday and you do so in a dramatic manner and suddenly things, you know, feel better and you, you're mentally, you know, feeling a little bit better about yourself in the locker room. And next thing you know, you've pulled off a sweep and listen, that's, that's not something that happens at the Ralph, the last team, to come in a non-conference play and sweep North Dakota in the Ralph, that was Maine back in 2006. That's you know, 16 years pretty much since that's happened. So this was, you know, we talk about what this did for Cornell in the pairwise. It dropped North Dakota all the way down to 11. And now, as Brad Schlossman you know, pointed out yesterday, North Dakota has not been a bubble team that often in the last decade and here they're going to have to kind of run through bubble land as they finish their schedule in the NCHC, knowing that one bad weekend that could drop them right out of the NCAA tournament field. That would be devastating. I think to North Dakota fans. And if Cornell keeps things rolling, those two wins and having the strength of schedule from North Dakota in their RPI is going to help them all the way out. I, I think that, uh, Cornell, though, that looked really iffy, is looking pretty solid as a as a postseason NCAA team if they keep it going. Uh, one more sweep that uh, we wanted to note before the break: AIC. Uh, they swept Holy Cross. They're now in the top spot in Atlantic hockey, and finally, after uh, half the season being played, you can really see what the standings look like because everybody's played either twelve or thirteen games now, which is about half of the league schedule. They jumped from fifth to first with a six-point weekend. Six points are uh, pretty significant uh, with a three-point win, and you can do some big jumping in one weekend. We were kind of wondering about AIC early on. They they had a rough time out of conference, but uh, I think Eric Lang's got another good team there in Springfield. Well, they still have uh, a big game. We talked about uh, non-conference games coming this weekend. Pair, like, a lot of pairwise implication in this game. I think it's Tuesday against UConn. UConn quietly has climbed up to 19th in, in the pairwise. And, you know, AIC is still, they're full in, I think, uh, 25th um, at 8, 9, and 1. But they've got a, obviously a couple, they got a quality, they got some quality in, in their their game against uh, uh, Quinnipiac where they, they've lost, lost one in overtime and tied one. So they've got some uh, a lot of the a lot of uh, quality win bonus, but you're finally starting to get to see them rolling here a little bit. Um, AIC prides themselves as a second half team. Um, Eric uh, believes that if he plays a really not good non conference schedule at the beginning, no matter what your record is, it'll make them better um, down the stretch. But uh, you know they don't have to travel very far coming up here. They've got a, a UConn game home against Mercyhurst at Sacred Heart home against Holy Cross, um, all to finish out uh, January. So, I mean, that's always good to be close to home and staying in your own beds and, and doing that. And then there's some really challenging games coming up for them down the stretch, uh, especially you've got to go to RIT, which, Ed, as you know, is always tough. you got uh, West Point, and then, and then they're down into four games left. So it, we'll see where they go, but a uh, really good statement win. Uh, they've got, they're getting good goaltending from two goalies and two transfers, one from Providence and one from RPI, uh, Kucharski and Calvaruso. And I mean, uh, they're here, they're, they're where they, everybody expected them to be. Will they stay there? I think that the next month will give them a really good chance to do that. Yeah. I think that January becomes a really important month. Obviously you mentioned the non-conference game against UConn. You can steal that game. Maybe that's a, that's a, that would be a big, confidence building win. But then if you get the wins, the, the games you're supposed to win, and that's what you know, coaches talk about it all the time. You got to win the games you're supposed to win the games against the bottom half of your league. But if you, you win those and then you win, you know, two thirds of your games against the top half of your league, you're going to win a league championship. And I, I feel like right now, this is the month that AIC and Eric Lang's team can put themselves in a position 
And then if you can, you know, then play pretty good hockey in the second, uh, this, the next month in February, you know, you're probably looking at yet another potential league title. And, and I, I'm so happy for what AIC has become because, you know, I, I, you know, Derek and Ed, that I started covering this league way back in the nineties and AIC, they made a couple of runs up to like fifth and sixth place, but for the most part, they were such a doormat. And this, you know, what they have done there has changed this program, turned it around. I love seeing them every year do well. And I love, you know, the energy that Eric Lang brings to a locker room. That's a, that's a coach with a lot of, a lot of excitement inside him. You know, so I, I'm rooting for AIC right now. I like the way that they're playing and uh, hopefully they can keep this up. Yeah, I would still, when looking at the standings and, you know, I still wouldn't count out some teams that are still kind of floating around there. Bentley, Canisius, Army's got, got games with them. I mean, there's a, there's a big log jam from basically second till uh, almost ninth. And there's only eight points separated. And you can see what two games does in a weekend or two wins, uh, six yeah. points. So that's, I a, that's, how, that's how you can go a from fifth to first in a weekend. <laughs> that's how close it has been all year. Yep. And there's still, there's still a lot of hockey left. So don't, let's not be giving them the title, but they did. They took a really good step with what they've got coming up close to home here in the next uh, month. You mentioned the, the two transfer goalies. Uh, Lang has really done a good job between recruiting and transfers. He he did an excellent job uh, in both accounts to pull together a pretty good squad this year. Yeah, I mean, he always, he does. He's always looking to improve his team, um, whether it's bringing somebody in a semester. Uh, I always gave him trouble. I call them unconventional. You know, he got a kid out of uh, club hockey. He's got kids out of, out of Europe that they've taken some kids from some perceived leagues that, that aren't, aren't uh, as strong, but, uh, like I said, I, I like Eric. I think he does a great job. He actually was in our building when we had our press conference uh, announcing that we were back, and he went up and did some some media availability for um, – I wasn't even there. I was in Arizona, but Eric was in our building with youth hockey. But, um, like, I always give them unconventional, but they, they, they leave every uh, – they don't leave any stones unturned as far as getting those players at. Let's take a break. We've got more to cover, including the Olympics and some hot goalies and some uh, hot plays on SportsCenter. When we continue, our podcast is brought to you by DCU Digital Federal Credit Union. Visit dcu.org. This is the USCHO Week in Review podcast from U.S. College Hockey Online. Sometimes it's not about wanting a new car. It's about needing one. And I needed one I could rely on. So I got an auto loan with DCU. They offer the same low rates on both new and used cars, and I was able to borrow a little extra to make a used car as good as new. My auto loan from DCU means a ride I can finally rely on, which feels like a pretty big thing. What will DCU mean to you? Insured by NCUA. Membership required. Visit dcu.org. Welcome back to USCHO Weekend Review for January 10th, 2022. A couple of goaltenders are really still pretty hot. And uh, one of them is uh, Northeastern's Devin Levi. A couple of shutouts over the weekend of LIU. And Minnesota State's Dryden McKay, who let in just one goal in two games against Ferris State. Both of them now tied for the national lead with eight shutouts. Eight shutouts. And we have half a season to play for both teams. I mean, if these guys stay hot, you, you're talking about, you know, maybe 10, 12, 13, 14 shutouts by the end of the season, either one of these goaltenders. Yeah. I mean, th- those are unheard of numbers and to, you know, to throw goals against averages that are both, I think they, the one is 1.17. The other one's 1.18 save percentages above nine forty, bat bordering on nine fifty, maybe even higher in some cases. I mean, this, this is unreal. These two goaltenders. And the, the funny thing is, is neither one of them are getting a ton of national attention. Maybe I've seen a little bit more for Devin Levi. Uh, I think the fact that he, you know, was a world junior goaltender, you know, with team Canada last year. And 
I think a lot of people were talking about that, but I mean, what an outstanding, you know, pair of net minders. And it just shows how this game continues to evolve, particularly goaltending. And, you know, both these, you know, well-coached kids that just seem to go out and perform well every single night. Well, I've got a, I got a direct message that, that proves different um, as far as getting uh, attention. I got a, a direct message uh, through Twitter. I, I can't, I don't know who it is. I don't know what their fan base is. It's one of those, uh, I guess, in, in, in the Twitter world is a troll, but said your love for, for Dryden McKay on, on your show. And, th- and then it said, let me let you tell you that I love what you guys are doing. I listen every week, but your love for Dryden McKay is making me vomit. Basically every week. All you do is talk about Dryden McKay, Dryden McKay, Dryden McKay, Dryden McKay. And uh, uh, so I found that funny. And then I, I get the show run down. And of course, Dryden McKay's in there again. I was going to find some way to weave this story in. But every week they say all you talk about is Dryden McKay. So uh, here we are again. But uh, to go into potentially double digits and shutouts is a career. I mean, I don't I. That's a, that's a career that not just a year. That's a, it, there's, there's other, there's goalies that don't get eight shutouts in a, a, a full career and there, some really, really good goalies. So we're in uncharted territory and um, a, apparently Jimmy, people do think that, that Dryden McKay is getting a lot of love outside of uh, uh, the national media. Maybe that's, maybe that's a compliment to us. We're now national media. I, I didn't expect that, that I'm, I'm getting direct messages and everything about our show, but hey, our ratings are up. I'm going to ask for a, a, a bonus here soon. Hey, has, <laughs> has any goaltender had more than 10? I know Ryan Miller had it, had 10 in the season, but has any goaltender had more than 10 in a season? I, I'm trying to think, did McKay have more than 10 shutouts in a season thus far in his career? And I'm just throwing that out there because I, I can't remember this off the top of my head, but I mean, 10 has always been the gold standard and here with, with, you know, a couple of full months left to this season, you're, you're looking at two goaltenders already with eight. I mean, this, this really is, as you just said, Derek, uncharted territory. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to, to, to that. I mean, it's, I mean, it actually, I do know the answer. It, uh, um, on the 30th, he set the, the net career shutout, um, record. But uh, Ryan Miller had 26 shutouts while playing for Michigan State. Uh, McKay got 27 in October. So, I mean, I don't think this is a record that you're going to see broken for, for a while. The, you, and I think part of the reason is with goaltenders is if they're doing well, I don't know if they're going to stay around this long. Are they going to be there for four years to be able to get those kind of numbers? And you're, you're talking to Dryden McKay. Is he in year five? He's only a senior at this point, but still, I mean, the, his, the, I mean, these numbers are just, I mean, there's, they're staggering at this point. And, you know, this is the, and I listen, I, I, he'll be the first one to tell you that there's a lot of good team defense that's played at Minnesota state. And I think you can, the same thing can be said for Jerry Keith's Northeastern team, but Devin Levi, you know, he still makes some pretty fantastic saves. And um, I just, uh, you know, it's it's shocking to see these types of goaltending numbers and it, making the Hobie and Richter race just that much more difficult to handicap. I found it online here, and it's 12. And it's from our old friend and out, uh, outstanding college hockey guy, uh, big time in 2000. And uh, he was at uh, Niagara. Greg Gardner. And uh, Greg Gardner. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah, Mercier's assistant co- associate head coach at, at Mercier's, Greg Gardner, propelled that to uh, uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets, uh, signing him. And uh, I was I was at Air Force then, and he was dominant. That team was was unbelievable. They went in and, and they won. Blaze McDonald had that team. They had they had a lot of uh, really good players who ended up being coaches. Uh, Chris McKenzie, Nate Handrahan, Greg Gardner. We go down the list, and they beat New Hampshire in the the first round of the NCAA tournament from the CHA, which had no auto bid at that time. And uh, McKay's, there's a whole bunch of people with 10 
McKay, Demko, David McKee, Ryan Miller. And then you go to nine. And I mean, those are the only ones in history into, into the uh, double digits. So you've got five guys in double digits. And, uh, but I will say this, uh, Blaine Locker in 1994, who I played against at Lake Superior, had five straight shutouts. Five straight shutouts. Uh, and he's not even in the top. Uh, uh, he's not even in the top eight as far as uh, or the, the top. He didn't have an eight in the year because he's not in that top group. But five consecutive shutouts. How's that? That's pretty crazy. Now, neither neither Levi nor McKay are kind of today's prototypical, really tall, lanky goalie. Five eleven, six foot for those guys. Is that shifting or is it just saying that uh, you don't have to be a certain shape to be a good goalie? <laughs> what are you like talking about Goldberg from the mighty ducks? I mean, a certain shape. <laughs> the, the days of putting the un- unathletic guys in net are, are way behind. Um, but I will tell you the NHL, I think one of the first thing that scouts look at are uh, our size. You got to be six, two or taller in the, in the, in the national hockey league. So these guys are, uh, you know, defying logic a little bit. Levi's over six. Levi's six two. Is he, He's I mean, listed at six foot on on this yeah, one uh, listing, but maybe. Uh, uh, I mean, McKay's not much bigger. I mean, these are these guys are um, once again we're in our uncharted territory. Let's put it that way. We'll see how see how they translate to pro hockey. Uh, that'll be a, a big question mark. That'll be the big question is is our there because there's been a lot of really good college goalies that have not translated very well. So we will see, I mean, this list, you look at uh, this list, I mean, the probably the best in the shutouts that, that you have is, is you got Ryan, uh, Ryan Miller. I mean, Demko obviously is, is going to be a good college goalie. David Lebanon, um, Galagia from Cornell who had nine the one year. I mean, then you got, you got a whole bunch of really good college goalies and then you got Schneider and, I mean, so I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out, but 12 could be in danger. Well, let's move on to the next thing. We were talking about skilled goalies, about guys scoring some skilled goals. Uh, Colgate and Niagara had the top two plays on SportsCenter. Uh, what what do you make of that, Derek? It's just, just sick goals. Love the skill. Ryan Namofsky and Colton Young. Ryan Namofsky from Niagara and, and – uh, uh, Colton Young from Colgate with with uh, between the legs uh, highlight real goals. I showed my son because he likes that stuff. Who's a U16 player, and he was like, "Wow!" You know, first of all, the confidence to try that, especially in Amoski's, because he had a full blown breakaway for um, you know from center to end. Uh, Young kind of was had had to do that to get the angle of the shot off. He was under pressure, but. Uh, the confidence to try that shows that the skill level of college hockey is getting there and the creativity. Um, if you would have missed, I'm sure Jason Lammers probably wouldn't have had a lot of good things to say to him when he got back to the bench, but um, you know, just the skill of, of the game, you know, you, you, you get that. And then you even got a couple, you know, and watching the Michigan game yesterday, Kent Johnson tries the Michigan um, and it doesn't work. It happened a couple other places that goalies are figuring that out. I mean, just the skill level to try some of that stuff now. And um, it's getting these guys, they're getting to be really good with the stick and being able to do things like that. And uh, the sky's the limit. I mean, look at, look at those goals. Those are big time goals. And to get that love from, from sports center uh, hats off to those guys, hats off to college hockey for, for getting the skill level a little bit higher and not just the prototypical uh, when you go to pro hockey and, and even talking to pro scouts is guys play a hundred miles an hour. They run around, they hit people, they play with a lot of energy. They get excited because they only have to do it 30 days. You're seeing a completely different hockey team now of college players. How soon before somebody tries the Trevor Zegras uh, Michigan pass from behind the net, that's got to be coming to college hockey soon too. Well, you, you got a choice there. There's options now. You got that to go along with the Michigan. There, there are options. I will, uh, I'll admit, and no, nobody that has ever met me will be surprised by this. I went down to my garage with my uh, eight-year-old yesterday and decided that I was going to try to do that uh, between-the-legs goal myself. And 
Um, and I was just using a tennis ball, not a puck because I would never be able to lift a puck doing that. And uh, I injured myself. So, uh, it just shows oh, how grind. difficult those oh, plays oh, are. <laughs> it's, it's, it, there's just so much talent. You know, this, it, I think that as much as I, as a parent kind of make fun of YouTube and some of the other channels out there, kids that sit there and practice these trick shots all day so that they, that when they're in a game that those can just become, you know, second nature plays. That's what we saw here. These, these kids, both of them knew exactly what they were doing before they took that shot. And they, 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 they made it look like the play could be executed second nature. Well, I'll tell you, my, my son does that before. That's, that's one of his pregame superstitions, uh, you know, before the team comes to the net and he'll stand there behind the net and he'll do the Michigan and then sprint off. I mean, and he can, he could do it. I mean, it, he, uh, he, I saw one time him want to try and I was like, really, come on. You had four people on you. You had two people. I mean, you're going to try that. And uh, you know, that's the coach and me talking, but they see that that's a really good point. YouTube and, and watching these highlights, they want to emulate what looks cool. And that's the society we're in. And um, it's made popular and you're going to see more and more um, the things that these kids can do. I should, I say kids, these things that these young men can do, and then now even into youth hockey nowadays are unbelievable because they try it. They would never try that before. When Mike Leg did the, Mich- the, the Michigan, he was like the second player ever. Bill Armstrong was the first. And it was just done because um, he was creative. But nobody thought to try that stuff. Now it's you're going to see it all the time. Well, let's move on to our last topic. And maybe we'll see some real skill from these players with the NHL not going to to Beijing for the Olympics. They're going to be drawing from a lot of college players and some pretty big names. Uh, Jim, Chris Peters at Daily Faceoff came up with a few Olympian rumors, uh, some players being considered for Team USA and Team Canada. Yeah, when you look up and down this list, I'll read it off to, to, to who we had kind of by school here. Drew Hellison, Boston College defenseman, uh, Matty Beneers, uh, Owen Power from Michigan. That would he'd be playing for Team Canada. He's a Canadian. Uh, Brock Favor at Minnesota. Ben Myers at Minnesota. Matt Nyes at Minnesota. Noah Cates at uh, Minnesota Duluth. Nathan Smith at Minnesota State, and Jack Sanderson at North Dakota. A lot of great. You know, we've talked about how strong the West is this year, and now you've got a lot of really good Western players that might get taken out uh, for a month here, so that their teams can, you know, so they can go and participate in the Olympics and. Um, I guess we what we're not we're not even seeing here, and it goes back to the conversation we had about five minutes ago. Could some of these good goaltenders too, you know, could McKay or could uh, Devin Levi potentially be on the radars of both, uh, you know, Team USA for McKay and, and Team Canada for for Levi? That's one of those questions you keep asking yourself. You know, how decimated could college hockey become throughout the, the Olympics here? And you know, we talked earlier about, you know, Jack LaFontaine being gone from Minnesota. Then you take, you know, Brock Favor, Ben Myers, and, and Matt Nyes out. That's three great players. And I think I think a team that really could miss a player is Jake Sanderson, you know, not being at North Dakota. We've talked about them being on the bubble here now. He's so much to that team. He is such a talented player that um, he'd really be missing their lineup. But I guess every one of these players in some way, shape, or form would be um, missed from a team. And, you know, I go back to when Blaze McDonald, the second Blaze McDonald mentioned in this, uh, this show, but he was at UMass Lowell a number of years ago um, when the NHL players were in the Olympics, but he had three really good French players and the team, I believe got to the Olympic break and they were something like 13 and two or 14 and two. And then those three players went to the Olympics from his team and played for team France over in the Olympics. Great experience for them. But I think Lowell, maybe went two and seven while they were gone and suddenly went from being number two in the pair wise to being below the, the Mendoza line out of the, the tournament. So, I mean, that that's how sharp of a difference these players can make. And that's one of those uh, concerns that I think every one of these coaches will have if they lose these players to the Olympics. And Jimmy, you did a really good job of, of kind of going through the, the players and, um, but I, I, I still think there's going to be more. I think to your point, we haven't got to the, the Euros, the European 
teams, taken some college guys. We haven't got to uh, Team Canada, which may take another one, whether you say Levi, whether it's whether it's uh, maybe Kent Johnson, uh, somebody like that. There, there could be some more. And I think we won't be able to really gauge who it's really going to affect the most. If you look at the list right now that Chris Peters did, and like, I'm glad that you brought up Chris because uh, the Big Ten network ran it yesterday. They made a mistake, and Chris is like, hey, how about giving me credit for this list? So Chris has done. Chris does an outstanding job with that, and and got to the bottom of a list. But if that list gets higher, of of players from uh, other country uh, from schools, you're going to see some teams affected. But the preliminary list that you have right now with Lafontaine lo- leaving, uh, it's tough for Minnesota. It's tough for Minnesota, and uh, you know Michigan. It, you got Veneers and Powers Power gone, and if uh, next thing you know they lose another. You're still you're starting to get into some uncharted territories in a stretch run too. This isn't in a World Junior where there's some non-conference games where you can build your schedule a little bit. This isn't a stretch run, and somebody, whether it's North Dakota or whether it's uh, one of the somebody will be hurt come pairwise time, and they will look at it and go, "There's no way we could have stopped these kids because it's a chance of a lifetime, but it costs us." I think we had that conversation a, a couple weeks ago. And you said, will people go? And, and I said, absolutely, that will go. And I think that you're going to see that. I think that list is going to grow. And uh, it will cost somebody. Like you said, like Lowell, it will cost somebody. I, I don't know. The, the one thing you mentioned, the Europeans, I don't know how much somewhat protected you might see some of the European college players from being pulled away. And that is because the European pro league still will you know, send players. But you're right. There are enough college players, highly talented college players from some of these European teams that will get a look. Um, I feel like they'll still try to go with the pro, you know, players that are in their pro leagues over there. And um, I, I don't know. I mean, you, you have lost the access to a lot of great European players in the NHL who typically would have gone over and played for teams like Russia or the, the Czechs or Finland or whatever. You know, so I, I, there's there there will be more than just these, you know, eight or nine that I listed here. They, you know, it, it will be in the double digits and it'll probably be closer to 20 before it's all over. Rumor has it that one of the coaches that was asked to be an assistant turned it down. Uh, I, I I have nothing to do. So they I would have accepted. I would have been able to have been off the, the podcast for a couple of weeks, but. Um, oh, no, okay. I didn't, uh, that was not now, me. Now I feel bad because I thought you turned down the Olympics to be with us. And I was going to tell you, you could do Zoom, Zoom from Beijing. Maybe. Uh, well, sorry, guys. You would love that. That would have been that would have been an unbelievable theater, wouldn't it? I get on Zoom with uh, uh, at the Olympics and do this. Oh, I, I should have done yeah, it. Darn it. I, you might I have apologize. been guys. behind the you might have been behind the Chinese government firewall, so it might have been a little bit more difficult well, they, to, to get to get a feed out of Beijing. They would have been uh, <laughs> checking out you guys. Who who's this? Who's he doing this? Brought you. You would have guys would have said absolutely not. They would have been diving into your back past, and we don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been ugly. <laughs> well, well, with that, we're going to wrap things up. This podcast has been brought to you by. DCU Digital Federal Credit Union. What will DCU mean to you? Find out today by visiting dcu.org. Membership required. For Jim Conley, for Derek Schooley, I'm Ed Trefsker. We'll catch you next time. This has been the USCHO Weekend Review Podcast, a production of U.S. College Hockey Online. Visit uscho.com slash podcasts to listen or subscribe. 